Okay, maybe I start with uh, the introduction. So hello to everyone. I'm happy to welcome all of you to our 19th seminar in the webinar series on precision physics and fundamental, fundamental symmetries. My name is Klaus Blaum from the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Holger Müller from UC Berkeley, US. Holger can be clearly described as someone with a passion for precision. He graduated with Achim Peters as advisor at the Humboldt University in Berlin and moved then to the US to become a postdoc in the group of Stephen Chu in Stanford. In July 2008, Holger joined the physics faculty at UC Berkeley. Since then, he has performed a series of world record precision measurements, among them the most precise determination of the fine structure constant alpha. So we are extremely happy that he agreed to give today's lecture. To the audience, as usual, in case you have questions, please type them into the chat room or the question and answer box, and we will address them at the end of the talk. Olga, we are looking forward to your presentation on atom interferometry and measurement of the fine structure constant. The floor is yours, Olga. Thank you, Klaus, for the nice introduction. And thank you, thanks to all the organizers for um, giving me this wonderful opportunity. As Klaus mentioned, most of my talk will be about the fine structure constant. Um, the current experimental situation is shown on the upper right-hand side in this um, slide. Um, the first question might be, why is it 1 over 137? And the answer is, clearly stated on this whiskey bottle, which is 137 proof, that's 68.5% alcohol. Okay, um, why is this all relevant? I think the motivation for precision measurements as such um, is that we have loud and clear signals from the skies showing us that the standard model is um, incomplete. Um, the standard model very it gives an extremely good description of 4% of the mass energy content of the universe, of which only a tenth or so is in form of stars. The bulk of it is in form of intergalactic gas. But 23% of the universe is dark matter and 73% is dark energy. And the standard model accounts for neither dark matter nor dark energy. All the signals we have for their existence come from our observatories, um, be it terrestrial observatories or space-based ones. But our terrestrial detectors have never turned up an uncontroverted signal for the existence of dark matter, let alone dark energy. Um, let me very briefly show you a graph that gives me great hope, um, which is the discovery of dark energy itself. Let's look at the inset. The x-axis is the redshift of an observed supernova, and the y-axis is the observed magnitude, the brightness. Now, those type 1a supernova are theorized to be, have always the same brightness, which means if you see a supernova that is very faint, then it must be far away. So this is a distant scale. The redshift, of course, this gives us um, a measurement of the speed at which that supernova recedes from the Earth. Um, distance equals look back time. So in the end, this is a graph of speed versus time. And if the universe expands at a constant speed, then you would expect that all the observed supernova lie on this diagonal line. Now, in the early 90s, when physicists set out for the first time to measure this, only this first part out to redshifts of 0.1 was known. Of course, everybody knew that gravity would slow down the expansion of the universe, and so you would expect that the cosmological expansion would slow down over time, and the big question was, is the slowing down strong enough to eventually stop the expansion and turn it around into a contraction, or is it not um, strong enough and the universe would keep um, expanding forever. Now, to the great surprise, when Saul Perlmutter and Rich Miller at Berkeley and Rees and others at other places um, found an algorithm to identify supernova automatically, so they could extend um, the scale out to redshifts of one. And to the great surprise, they found that all the data points lay above the diagonal, indicating a speed up 
which was completely unexpected. So why do I show this? First of all, I think it's good to show the experimental evidence for this claim. And second, um, it shows that if you can measure something an order of magnitude further, you might make an important discovery. In precision measurement, more hope is derived from graphs like this, which I can shamelessly brag about because I haven't contributed anything to it. It shows the accuracy of atomic clocks over time from the first cesium atomic clock by Essen and Perry in 56 to almost the most modern um, optical clocks. And this graph is a few years old. Um, if it was updated, then there would be more points down here in the region of 10 to the minus 19 precision in 2020. Now, if you draw a straight line from this um, first clock on the graph to the last clock on the graph, you find a doubling of the precision every other year, similar to the Moore law in, um, of the semiconductor industry that the number of transistors on a chip can double every other year. This exponential progress is great because if I have a theoretical signal for, let's say, a dark energy particle affecting the ticking rate of atomic clocks at the 10 to minus 20 level, I can extrapolate and say that probably within the next decade or so, we would be able to see it. Um, let's look at, let's zero in on the um, topic, on the um, more specific topic of my talk, which is interferometry. In interferometry, um, we take a source of light, for example, um, split it in two interferometer arms with a beam splitter, a semi-transparent mirror, right? The two arms reach a combiner, which is the same as the original beam splitter, and then are directed to the detector, right? And at the detector, I can have constructive interference when the waves oscillate in phase, or destructive interference when the partial waves compensate each other and um, detect a light variation. Now, the, the reason that interferometry can be so extremely sensitive is that the arm lengths can be thousands, millions, and even trillions of wavelengths, while an arm length change of half a wavelength makes a difference from um, between no light on the detector and 100% light on the detector. And that's how LIGO was able to be so sensitive as to pick up gravitational strains on the order of 10 to the minus 20, um, leading to the famous discovery of gravitational waves. LIGO has an arm length of four kilometers and the arms are traversed about 100 times through enhancement cavities. Um, and that together with um, the strong laser intensity of the LIGO detector gives it an enormous scale factor. Um, on the other hand, light interferometers such as LIGO are relatively restricted in what they can pick up. I can measure mechanical um, arm length strain and look for gravitational waves, um, but photons travel at the speed of light and have zero rest mass, no charge, no magnetic moment, so they don't interact much with their environment. Wouldn't it be nice if I could use um, particles with all these properties to make precision sensors for other quantities? And of course, that is possible. I replace the source of light by a source of cold atoms. I replace the semi-transparent mirrors by um, beam splitters for atomic matter waves, and I can build an atom interferometer by virtue of the fact that um, a traveling particle corresponds to a matter wave with a wavelength given by the momentum of the particle as theorized by Louis de Broglie, of course. Now, in, laser, in light interferometry, very often the source of photons is a laser. I have coherent photons, right? In atom interferometry, this could happen by using a Bose-Einstein condensate for the atomic source but it's not at all clear that this is always an advantage. Why? Photons don't interact with one another, at least not at any measurable level, um, but atoms do. Therefore, in a laser interferometer, it's very good to have all the photons in the same state. That helps me suppress um, technical noise sources, but it's not so good 
not always so good to have a condensed atom source because they typically have a very large density of atoms and there are two types of atomic physicists. Um, for one, they like atom-atom interactions because they can study them, but for precision measurements, atom-atom interactions are typically a horrible systematic effect. And therefore, I want my atom source to be as dilute as possible. For this reason, in this talk, we will always use non-condensed thermal atoms. What are the beam splitters for matter base? Well, that's very easy. Um, in theory, I just need to fire a photon at an atom. The atom recoils with the momentum of the photon, H bar K. And by tuning the laser intensity to a good level, I can make this interaction happen with 50% probability so that half the atomic wave packet stays where it was and the other starts moving. And that makes a nice coherent beam splitter for an atom. In that sense, the role of light and matter is reversed in this interferometer. Here the, in LIGO, the wave was electromagnetic and the beam splitters were objects made of atoms, whereas in an atom interferometer, the beam splitters are made of photons. Okay, um, I don't have time to really explain the interesting and um, exciting history of matter wave interferometry. Let's start with de Broglie's PhD thesis in 1924, where matter waves were first suggested to exist. And only four years later, Davison and Burma could give experimental evidence for electron interference. Um, the field of atom interferometry itself picked up in the early 90s. Um, here's an observation from Carnal and Lunek, who at that time were working at ETH in Zurich, who used a thermal beam of um, noble gas atoms together with micro-manufactured gratings to essentially build Young's double slit experiment with atoms. At the same time, Kasevich and Chu, as well as Rila, realized so-called light pulse atom interferometer where the um, beam splitter is a light wave and not a material grating. For precision measurement, this has one key advantage. While any material grating, such as used by Carnal and Lunik, is subject to manufacturing tolerances, it's a man-made object, a light beam has its wavelength given to very high precision by the frequency of the light. And that frequency can nowadays be measured with the precision of atomic clocks by virtue of the femtosecond optical frequency cone, which was itself a Nobel Prize to Ted Henge and John Hall not long ago. Um, so whereas here the diffraction angle and therefore the phase shift measured in the interferometer is in part given by these man-made objects, in light pulse atom interferometry, they are given by the momentum of photons, which to very high accuracy is known if and when the frequency of the laser is known. At this point, I want to inject a first um, caveat. We might think that the wave number and therefore the momentum of photons is simply given by the um, wave number and the wave number is simply the frequency divided by C. But unfortunately, K equals omega over C only for a plane wave. And in the lab, nothing is an, is an exact plane wave. So there will be corrections to that relation. But for the first seven or eight digits, um, this relation is very accurate. All right. So here is a little more about the background. Um, so particles are waves. How do I calculate the phase of the atom interferometer? Here's a schematic of a simple so-called Mach-Zehnler atom interferometer that's used for measuring gravity. The atoms are laser cooled in a magneto optical trap. They are launched up in an atomic fountain so that they are in free fall for something like a second. Um, the largest atom interferometers these days have increased that to a total of two seconds by building atomic drop towers as tall as 10 meters. And we will see how that time can be increased to even beyond two seconds. At a time t naught, I fire the laser and I kick the atom with the recoil of a photon. In actual fact, two photons are used. Why? The excited state of the atom typically decays within a few nanoseconds and the incoherent spontaneous decay would destroy the coherence of the atom interferometer. 
Therefore, I'm driving a two-photon transition by which the photon absorbs, uh, the atom absorbs a photon from the first laser beam, recoiling up, while the upper laser beam stimulates it to immediately re-emit the photon, so the atom recoils up once more and is now back in the ground state, so that the spontaneous decay is um, inhibited. So this doubles the recoil momentum, which is good and eliminates decoherence mechanism. After a time interval big T, I fire the laser again so that um, the upper interferometer arm gets kicked down and the lower one gets kicked up so that they merge at the time of the third beam splitter, which brings them to interference. Here's an actual picture of the atomic cloud taken in our lab. At this moment, the phase was such that most atoms emerged at the lower part. Um, if the phase shift changes by 180 degrees, most atoms will emerge at the upper part A. How do I calculate the phase of the atom interferometer? There are standard methods such as the WKB approximation. Um, essentially, it's given by integrating the Lagrangian of the atom across around the closed loop given by the space-time trajectories. Um, in addition, whenever the atom absorbs a photon, the local phase of the photon gets added to the matter wave packet and it gets subtracted for um, stimulated emission. So those are standard methods. And the nice thing is that there are very simple calculations that determine that phase to very high accuracy. To drive home the enormous lever arm, the enormous scale factor of atom interferometers, let me plot the detected atom number as function of the phase difference between the interferometer arms. Those are mathematical plots, but they're plotted to scale. The fringes are so fine that I can't see them. I have to zoom in several times before I can see the fringes. And I have to do this many times until I can see these fringes here measured by Ken Yao Chang at Stanford in the 90s. So this isn't even state-of-the-art data. That should show you the enormous sensitivity of atom interferometers. A very small phase variation gives rise to a very strong variation of the detected atom numbers. And in the future, of course, we hope we can make this even better. Um, this has been used by many people for very different purposes. For example, people have measured new the Newtonian gravitational constant. This is data measured by Gel Mutino in Florence um, in 2014. This talk will focus on measuring the fine structure constant. And um, here's a picture of the Stanford 10 meter atomic drop tower where they have performed tests of gravity and quantum mechanics. And there's a very exciting preprint on the archive server where they have turned this into a test of the um, equivalence principle for rubidium 87 and 85. Okay, let's introduce the key player in this talk, the fine structure constant, which measures the strength of the electromagnetic interaction um, between two elementary particles. The current co-data value is shown here. And because the fine structure constant is important in all fields of physics, it's not surprising that many fields of physics have contributed a precision measurement of the fine structure constant. Those measurements have been performed using nuonium, neutrons, um, gyromagnetic ratio of the proton, the quantum Hall effect. And comparing all these measurements is a good check of the consistency of the laws of physics and of the experimental methods across all fields of physics. But the most accurate measurements are shown in the zoom here. They are either based on measuring the magnetic moment of the electron, and particularly the um, gyromagnetic anomaly, G minus two. The electron, as we all know, is a little magnet, right? And flipping the orientation of that magnet in a magnetic field takes an energy proportional to the Bohr magneton times the G factor of the electron. This G factor is exactly two in the Dirac theory of the electron, but in actual fact is a tiny bit higher due to quantum electrodynamics corrections. And this deviation of the G factor from two has been measured to 10 decimal places of precision, and that can be used to back out the fine structure constant. 
Um, of course, people have wondered why um, the fine structure constant is 137. And my favorite explanation is that um, chlorophyll consists of 137 atoms. And it's also the largest prime factor of the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and so on. And I already mentioned bourbon whiskey. Um, to talk a little bit more about um, this magnetic moment, if I know the fine structure constant to high precision, I can employ QED, evaluating more than 10,000 Feynman diagrams in a calculation that goes up to the order alpha to power of 10, the fifth order in perturbation theory. Um, actually, sorry, the fifth order, right? Um, to make a prediction for the electron magnetic moment. Now, the interesting thing is that it's not only QED. Um, at the current level of precision, I have to know about the existence of hadrons. And besides the electron, even virtual muons <clears throat> um, enter this calculation. Unfortunately, the muon is not shown in this graph, but it is very measurable at the current accuracy. And very often in physics, there is an extremely good theory, but no good data, or the other way around. But in this case, everything seems to check out. The fine structure constant can be measured very accurately. The calculation is probably the most accurate um, standard model calculation ever done. And the measurement of the electromagnetic moment has an equal precision. The hope is, of course, that if known hadrons shift the value of g minus 2 around, um, then maybe unknown particles, maybe a dark matter candidate, contributes another shift of the fine structure of G minus two, which could be detected in a very precise comparison of theory and experiment. That's the hope. Um, one such particle is suggested by the muon G minus two measurement uh, mystery. Um, the fact that the muon magnetic moment disagrees from the standard model um, prediction according to the best available data. And we're all excited by um, a new measurement of the muon magnetic moment that is expected to be announced very soon from Fermilab. So we'll see what happens. Anyway, this muon G minus two measure mystery could be from so-called dark photons, which is one of those dark sector candidates that come up in connection with the dark um, matter puzzle, right? There are other hints for existence of those massive photons and accordingly, Many people have been looking for um, dark photons. Um, I'm not a particle physicist, but um, here is the current experimental part of the current experimental situation. Um, at least this plot was um, current a few years ago, where this is the mass of the dark photon from 1 MeV to 10 GeV. And this is the mixing angle, the coupling constant of the dark photon. And all the colored regions here are ruled out. Um, one of them is ruled out by previous measurements of G minus two. The red band here is what would be favored if the G minus two um, anomaly of the muon turned out to be real. Um, here's one way of how those experimental limits were derived. Um, it's essentially a giant X-ray tube. So a 100 GeV electron beam hits a target in which it might convert into dark photons. So whenever an, elect um, whenever an electron loses energy by um, emitting dark photons, the energy loss could be detected in a detector here. That leads to one type of limit, that's the invisible mode. So the um, emitted x-rays decay into dark matter and the energy loss is detected. I could also look for the visible mode where um, the dark photon detects into electron positron pairs which are then detected and that leads to limits that look like this. And um, let's not go into this too much because there are probably people in the audience who can explain that much better than me. How do I measure alpha with an atom interferometer? It all boils down to this equation which we all have seen maybe in different disguises that the energy of an electron in the lowest Bohr orbit is of course given by the Rydberg constant times h bar c. 
but it's also given by one half alpha squared MEC squared. So if I know h bar c, the Rydberg constant, and the electron mass, then I can solve this for alpha. What do I need to know for that? The Rydberg constant is the most well-measured um, fundamental constant from spectroscopy of hydrogen, so that's working. Unfortunately, it is not possible to measure h bar. What I would need to know is h bar over the mass of electrons, um, or in the current definition of the international system of units, the Planck constant now has a um, has been assigned a fixed value, so it's now a, just a unit conversion factor, right? Unfortunately, the ratio H over M electron is not known to very high precision. What is known, thanks actually to the work of our chairman, Klaus Blaum, is the ratio of the electron mass to the atomic mass unit, okay? That is extremely well known because I can spin these particles and I can spin an electron and a particle in a penning trap and measure the frequency ratio. Um, but what I need to know is H over M electron. I can measure H over the mass of an atom with an atom interferometer and then mass ratios of atoms and electrons can be very well measured again by penning trap measurements. So what I do is I measure H over M with an atom interferometer, where m is the mass of an atom. I look up the Rydberg constant as measured by the likes of Ted Hensch and Thomas Udem, and I look up the mass of the electron in atomic mass units, and I can combine all these um, to a measurement of alpha, and then use QED to predict g minus two. Okay, that's the theory anyway. How would I measure h over m? Well, in principle, it's very easy. I take an atom, and I fire a photon at it with momentum h bar k. The atom recoils and then measure the velocity of the atom. That gives me a measurement of h bar k over m. And since k is known, this is a measurement of h over m. But how would I even measure this velocity? I could measure it by the Doppler effect, for example. The moving atom will, take, will see the laser frequency at a slightly different value. And so if I want to drive a transition in the now moving atom, I have to detune the laser a little bit. Unfortunately, for cesium atoms, the velocity is a mere three and a half millimeters per second. And the Doppler effect is about two kilohertz only. I have to measure a Doppler effect of two kilohertz out of a transition frequency of 350 terahertz to only see that the effect is non-zero. To get a 10 to the minus 10 measurement of the fine structure constant, I would need to measure the transition frequency to 22 decimal places, which is impossible. Um, in effect, the difficulty of this schematic arises from the fact that I'm trying to measure a tiny quantity on top of a huge quantity. This is similar to measuring the height on the of the grass on the Empire State Building by first measuring from the street level to the top of the grass and then measuring from the street to the top of the skyscraper and subtracting. It's inefficient. So we have to climb the skyscraper and measure just the grass. And with an atom interferometer, we can do that. Um, by the way, this is a measurement that was started long ago in 2004 when I joined the group of Steve Chu as a postdoc and here are some of the heroes of the first hour. This is my friend Sheng Wei Chao, who was, the, um, who was the grad student on the project. And Steve Chu at the time was very um, keen on having us wear laser goggles all the time. Um, anyway, so here's how the atom interferometer works. I start with an atom which is in free fall in a vacuum chamber. And at a time t naught, I fire my laser pulse, kicking half the atomic wave packet up. And then with more laser pulses, I make it go back down. The phase difference between the two interferometer arms contains a term arising from the kinetic energy of the moving part of the wave function, which is written here, 8n squared omega recoil t. Omega recoil is the kinetic energy recoil from one photon 
expressed as a frequency. It's h bar k squared over 2m, where m is the mass of an atom. Um, okay. Um, the number n is the number of photon pairs I use to kick the atom here. So by increasing the number of photon pairs, I can quadratically increase the um, kinetic energy and therefore my signal. So that's a powerful tool that we will employ a great deal in this experiment. Unfortunately, um, gravity also acts on the atom. So there's a huge gravitational term, which is about 10 or even 100 times as large as the term that I want to measure, because those atoms are in the gravitational field of the Earth. So this interferometer would be good to, for measuring alpha to maybe six digits of precision, because that's the limit at which I can measure little g. The problem is little g varies. If I go up in the lab by one meter, g varies on the sixth, on the seventh digit, simply because I'm getting further away from the Earth's core, right? So I cannot know little g to extreme precision. So I have to find a way to either increase the signal or suppress this term, and we do both. Um, we use multi-photon Bragg diffraction to kick the atoms with the momentum of many photons. And um, I won't go into the details of the theory, but it's essentially we fire a pair of counter-propagating laser beams at the atom, and those laser beams are detuned from one another in such a way that if the atom absorbs one photon and gets stimulated to emit a beam, a photon into the other beam, energy and momentum conservation are not simultaneously conserved, but they are conserved in this example when the atom absorbs and emits four photons each. Okay, that's how we can kick the atom with the momentum of n photons. Um, while not kicking it with a num with n plus two or n minus two photons. So typically we choose n equals five. That means we kick the atom with the momentum of 10 photons. That multiplies the kinetic energy from the recoil by a factor of 100. Why do we use 10 and not 100? Because the required laser power, this is a very high order process, right? The required laser power goes up sharply with n. So n equals 5 for 10 photon beam split as seems to be the sweet spot. To suppress the gravitational term, we run two atom interferometers at the same time. Um, they are kind of upside down copies of one another. The lower one is here, that's the one we already discussed. The upper one is there where the initial recoil, it's a little bit hard to say, but this is a mirror image of the lower interferometer arm, and the result is that the gravitational phase of these two is the same. Gravity is always pointing down, but the recoil term flips sign. And so by taking the difference between the two, I can eliminate the gravitational term. This interferometer is good for measuring alpha to eight or nine digits of precision. Um, one of the reasons why it's limited is that the average height of the two interferometers is not the same, and so the cancellation of gravity is not perfect. Um, finally, I have to ask myself, how do I even extract the signal? With all these tricks to increase the sensitivity, I've also increased my sensitivity to unwanted influences such as vibrations. And it turns out, if you look at these graphs here, they are actually measured data it's impossible to see the sinusoidal variation of the atom number with phase here because vibrations smear out the fringes by way more than two pi. What I can still do, however, is a parametric plot where I plot the output of one interferometer on the x-axis and the other one on the y-axis. And the, these two extremely noisy data sets combine to plot a nice ellipse. Works because the shape of the ellipse is given by the common mode signal that I want to measure, while the, um, while the location of each data point on the ellipse is given by the gravitational and vibrational signal that I want to suppress. So running the experiment many times, each time I get a signal that looks like this, for example, um, the two 
these are fluorescent signals while the four outputs of the two interferometer fall past a detector. The peaks on the left here are the outputs of one interferometer. The peaks on the right are the outputs of another interferometer. The stuff in the middle are leftover atoms that did not take part in any of the interferometers. Um, from data sets such as this, I can, um, here are the actual ellipses that are plotted. What's the number of big N here? Well, we have employed an additional trick to increase the sensitivity even further, and that's called Bloch oscillations. I take the atom interferometers here in the middle, and use a coherent method to accelerate the entire atom interferometer downwards or upwards with the momentum of hundreds of photons. Um, this works by putting the atoms in a so-called optical lattice, which is a standing wave which creates a periodic potential on the atom, and then start accelerating the standing wave by making slight detunings to the frequency of the lasers involved. Okay. In that way, I can separate the atom interferometers further, increase my phase shift, and have a great handle on systematic effects because the scaling of the phase with the number big N of Bloch oscillations is a very simple formula. Um, from doing that, I get lots of measurements of the fine structure constant that I can then average. At this point, um, yeah, here is the Bloch oscillation sequence shown. So right here in the middle, we make coherent matter wave accelerations to increase the splitting between the interferometer arms. In the end, the velocity difference between the fastest atoms here and the fastest atoms here is on the orders of meters per second. So this is truly quantum mechanics on a macroscopic scale of atom velocity. The setup looks like this. There is a magneto-optical trap to prepare the atoms. The atoms get accelerated upwards so that they are in free fall for about a second, and then they get detected here. And there's a clever arrangement of laser beams that is used to um, generate those photon kicks. The arrangement is optimized such that the laser frequencies whose relative phase matters always travels exactly the same path so that vibrations of optical elements are largely cancelled. Here's a picture from the lab. So these are lots of um, homemade lasers. These, are, for example, are two homemade lasers. And there's another optical table full of lasers. And all those lenses and mirrors are there to direct the um, laser beams to where they need to go to make the magneto-optical trap, additional cooling stages, detection beams, and other beams. Um, do let me at this point pause my explanation of the fine structure constant for a few minutes and introduce you to a completely orthogonal way to do atom interferometry. And this is cavity-based atom interferometry. So the question is, does an atom interferometer always have to be this large? Why is it this large anyway? Because we need to give the atoms room to fall. If we want to handle them for a second, we need to launch them up and watch them fall for about a meter. Can't we just hold on to the atoms? And for many years, the answer seemed to be holding on to the atoms is a bad idea because the whole point of atom interferometry was that the atoms are in a field-free region. I do my best to keep radiation and magnetic fields out, except for those short beam splitter pulses. Now, if I want to hold the atoms, I could use an optical lattice, um, but the optical lattice isn't perfect, and that would generate parasitic phase shifts. So what we did is we built the first cavity-based atom interferometer. So there's a cavity in this vacuum chamber in which the laser has to match the boundary conditions given by those two mirrors and has to be a very nice Gaussian mode with known properties. And this is a picture from the lab. Here's Vicky Shu, the um, grad student who is right now leading the project. Here is the experimental setup with all those lasers and mirrors and so on. Right. The upper cavity mirror is located here. 
And with that, we've been able to hold the atoms for a truly long time. These are interference fringes after holding the atom for 200 milliseconds, here after one second, and we went by five seconds, 10 seconds, and I note that 10 seconds of free fall would already be a humongous setup, right? 15 seconds, and even after 20 seconds of hold time, we can still see matter wave interferences. As far as I know, this is the longest lasting superposition of um, spatially separated quantum states that was ever measured. Um, why is that good? Um, one reason it's good is that um, it averages over vibrational noise. So I can measure the sensitivity of this to vibrational noise, that's the green line here, and compare it with the sensitivity of a standard atom interferometer. And I can see a hundred and even thousand fold suppression of the vibrational noise in this case. Um, so this is how that was measured. And you see that it agrees with theory very well. Suffice it to say that there's finally a method to get rid of the tall drop towers and generate matter wave interferences for very long times. But with that, let's go back to the fine structure constant. So here are again those ellipses. Now, what I've presented to you, of course, is the textbook variation variant of atom interferometry, where there are no systematic effects. But in the real world, there are systematic effects. One powerful way to detect those systematics is to run the atom interferometer at different pulse separation times, because the signal we want is strictly proportional to T. So if I have a feature in the phase that is not strictly proportional to T, it must be a systematic effect. In the, the systematic effects may not be constant, so we have to keep monitoring them as we take data. So what we typically do is we take data at T equals five milliseconds for a minute or so, then switch to 10, 20, 40, and finally 80 milliseconds. And this takes about 10 minutes, and after that, we make one fit that gives us one estimate for the fine structure constant. We call that a scan. And then we repeat these scans for an entire day of about 24 seconds and combine these things into one global fit that gives us an estimate for the fine structure constant. And finally, out of 30 or so days of measurement, we get our final value. Why only 80 milliseconds? Haven't you just bragged about being able to have the atoms fly for a much longer time? Yes, this is true. But for the measurement of alpha in particular, um, the signal is linear in T, while one of the leading systematics, the gravity gradient, goes like T cubed. So as I increase T, I might gain more signal, but I gain systematics even faster. That's why we have no ambition to break the world record in T here, but in fact, we try to take our data at the smallest values of T that still give us enough signal to noise. In precision measurement, it is very important to that your analysis is objective and not guided by spying at other people's results. And a very good method to make sure that this is the case is to do a blind analysis. In our data, in our experiment, there is one piece of equipment that tells us what the laser frequency is. The laser frequency varies a bit by about a megahertz or so, but we know those variations and can extract the exact laser frequency. We send that code to a friend at Caltech, Rana Adhikari, who's a member of the LIGO collaboration, and asked him to add a random number to the code and send us back the compiled code. Um, so while we were taking the data, we did not know what our laser frequency is. And so all we knew is that our result would fall somewhere within this band. Okay. And then even when we think that we have ironed out all systematic effects, we rerun the experiment again and again with varied parameters. And each time we vary, let's say, the beam pointing of the, actually this happened by an accident. The laser beam was inadvertently misaligned and we noticed that our value of alpha had changed. 
So um, what happens, right? We discovered that the beam was misaligned and set it back and put the amount of misalignment into a simulation of the experiment. And we were very happy to see that the simulation reproduced the observed change of alpha. And we did that with a lot of other changes. We changed the number of block oscillations, the laser power, we purposely make the contrast of the interferometer verse and so on and so on. And we were essentially working until we would understand the effects of all these variations so that our model would reproduce the observed change as function of, for example, contrast. And only then we felt ready to unblind. And so here is the result after unblinding. Um, this is our new data point. It's at a precision of 0.2 part per billion. That's slightly better than the best previous measurement from electron G minus two, that was 0.24 parts per billion, and about threefold better than the best atomic physics measurement, which was 0.6 parts per billion. Now our data and the previous atomic physics measurement um, overlap completely, the error bars overlap completely, but they have a slight tension with the value from G minus two, F 2.5 sigma. So um, to zero order, however, let's ignore the 2.5 sigma and let's um, use Jerry Gabriel's words that the prediction of the electron G minus two from the fine structure constant using the standard model can be called the standard model's greatest triumph because here are experimentally measured quantities connected by a theory that involves 10,000 and more Feynman diagrams, and they basically check out. A lot of things have to be correct in physics. So um, what this means is at this level of accuracy, the first five orders of QED have to be correct. The influence of the muon has to be correct at the 10% level. The influence of virtual hadrons has to be correct at the 10% level. And we're only one order of magnitude away from seeing the influence of the weak interaction in a tabletop experiment. So this is great. Um, in the future, we may be able to improve that precision tenfold. And Jerry Gabriels is planning to improve the measurement of um, G minus two tenfold, at that point, we would actually be able to see the weak interaction. I apologize to um, the hadronic experts in the audience that I think this bar is slightly outdated and the error bar of the hadronic contribution may have been reduced a lot in the meantime. Um, anyway, but for now, let's look um, being good physicists, we want to understand what the discrepancy is due to. Let me first say that I have a high degree of confidence in our measurement because um, we worked hard at it and um, tried to do everything right. Um, there could be, but nevertheless, there could of course be a systematic error undiscovered in our measurement. There could be one in the measurement of G minus two, there could be one in the mass ratio. And by the way, Klaus Blaum is working on an improved measurement of that mass ratio, so we are all excited to um, see what might come out of this measurement. Um, speculating, but now another possibility is that the 10,000 Feynman diagrams connecting alpha and G minus two, that there might be a small mistake in there. And in fact, this calculation shifts every couple of years by a little bit um, from a revaluation of some of these terms. A particle physicist here has put the electron G minus two anomaly and the muon G minus two anomaly in context, plotted them in this coordinate frame. And now you see that globally, lepton magnetic moments seem to deviate by slightly more than four sigma from the standard model. Um, there have been theory papers, one example being here, arguing that even though these discrepancies have the opposite sign, they can nevertheless have the same origin. Here's one by Davo Diesel and Marciano. There have been theory papers um, making the opposite claim, and this all is way above my pay grade, so I'm not going to comment on it. 
Um, what does the measurement mean in terms of dark photon limits? Well, it turns out that our measurement strongly disfavors dark photons because the discrepancy has the wrong sign to be explained with dark photons. So there was a short time when the limits derived from our measurement versus Jerry were better than this CERN NA64 collaboration, but fortunately for them and unfortunately for us, this is no longer true and they're slightly better. I might have an updated graph a little later. Um, but the exciting thing is that both um, traditional high energy physics experiments and tabletop experiments can make contributions to these plots. Um, here is another type of slightly less well-motivated dark sector candidate shown, an axial vector boson, which is actually favored by our measurement. Um, here are some of these um, theory papers that I already mentioned. Um, let's look at the systematic error budget for a few minutes and um, let's take a look at how we might be able to improve this in the future. I need to speed up a little bit because I'm running out of time. So let's just look at the error budget, look at the big terms. Those are laser frequency, acceleration gradient, and the GOI phase. The GOI phase is the fact that a real laser beam, as shown here on the right, is not a plane wave and therefore has a different phase than a um, plane wave as function of where the atoms are. Right? And there are some new systematic effects you, arising from our use of multi-photon Bragg diffraction. And fortunately, the big effects aren't new and the new effects aren't big. Um, What's also striking is that the bulk of these systematic effects have to do with the size and quality of the laser beam. So they can all be improved by making one change to the experiment, a bigger, thicker, and higher quality laser beam. The others come from, let's say, our ignorance of the acceleration gradient, the gravity gradient arises from the question, where are the atoms as function of time? So those can be improved by controlling the position of the atoms. So by making these two changes, we believe we can reduce the error bar of the measurement more than tenfold. And that's the um, goal of a new version of the experiment, which is shown schematically here. The vacuum chamber has become taller, but most importantly, thicker, so that it can accommodate a very thick laser beam that whose properties are more close to an ideal plane wave. Filling that thick laser beam with laser intensity takes a lot of power, so we're working and have actually demonstrated parts of this system already, which instead of using a continuous wave five watt laser that we then block most of the time, we will generate radiation only when we need it, so we can now work with kilowatts of peak power without increasing the average power of the laser by a large factor. Um, so this is how this will look like. Here's some CAD drawings of it, and all those parts are now waiting in various rooms in, um, at, in the Berkeley Physics Department, and as soon as we are able to resume full operation in the lab, we will set it up. Um, that's where we are now. Um, here's some details on the laser system that I will skip because we're running out of time. But I want to um, highlight that this is already working. Okay, here is a plot of the output power as function of input power and so on. Anyway, let me wrap up. Um, here's our new atom interferometer geometry to suppress the gravity gradient, which has already um, been shown to work and has just now accept, been accepted by FISREF A. Okay, um, with that, here are my conclusions. So we have performed a 0.2 part per billion level measurement of the fine structure constant. We're moving forward to a next generation measurement in precision measurement Precision measurement is often portrayed as boring and long-winded. And the reason is that now we understand how to make a 0.2 part per billion measurement. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to use the demonstrated method and improve it in only key factors. 
so that we can use our understanding of the systematic error budget. So we're not reinventing the wheel, we're making a higher powered, thicker and higher quality laser beam, and that should um, get us to the point 02 part per billion level. Um, with that, I want to show you some pictures of my group, especially Wei Cheng was involved in the old measurement. Zach is involved and Eric are involved in the new measurement. Where is Spencer here and I need also working on that. So it's a great team and um, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>